When fixing the posterior column, historically I've had to go retrograde, which either means positioning the patient in the prone position, so I have access to the ischial tuberosity and I can place my screw from the ischial tuberosity proximally uh, into the, or cranially into the pelvis. The other option is to do the patient supine, and in that case, I'm lifting the leg up and working uh, uh, up the uh, ischial tuberosity underneath the leg while somebody's holding the leg up. And as you can imagine, that can be quite challenging either in a polytraumatized patient or in a larger patient, or really in any patient in general. The bed can get in your way, someone has to manage the leg, fluoroscopic imaging can be a challenge. And so one of the advantages of the Curvifix screw is that I can place a posterior column screw in the anagrade fashion through the gluteus medius pillar. Uh, and it's made placing the posterior column screw quite easy when I am doing it in conjunction with other fixation of the acetabulum or pelvic ring. I can do everything in the supine position, which I find very advantageous, both from a patient positioning perspective, as well as from uh, an imaging perspective and from an operative perspective. When doing a posterior column screw antegrade, the key is to, again, focus on your imaging. Uh, the two workhorse images for me are a rollback Jude. Go ahead and shoot that, please. And there you can see the posterior column. You can see the outline of the acetabulum there. And then the other view is a uh, obturator oblique. We're not going to go to that yet because I'm going to start with my starting point. So go back proximal. To get the starting point for uh, a uh, posterior column screw through a uh, anagrade fashion or through the gluteus medius pillar, what you want to do is place your guide wire uh, in onto the uh, uh, pelvis between the inner and outer table. So you can sometimes palpate the inner and outer table, uh, particularly on a thin patient, and you want your, your wire to be in between the two tables. Shoot that. Okay, and I want that wire pointing or aiming towards the posterior column. There we go. We can see that I'm headed to the posterior column and I'm posterior to my acetabulum. I'll gently tap this wire in, maintaining my position between the columns. Shot. There you go. You can see now that I'm headed behind the acetabulum, and I'm not, um, and I'm not going too, too posterior, so I'm going to miss my posterior column. Shoot that. Yep, other view, please. On this view, it looks like you're bisecting the femoral head, which is the ideal position for the wire. You want to be aiming down towards the ischial tuberosity. Here I'll use the oscillate feature on the drill to oscillate so I don't violate or breach the wing. Great. Shoot that. Good. And sometimes I'll go in by hand a little bit just to get the wire started. Okay, good. I'll take a knife to me, please. Because this entry point is relatively superficial, the need to use the triple sleeve uh, is less um, necessary. Uh, and so in this case, I'll just use uh, an opening reamer and, and then place my uh, tube for my ball tip guide wire. Thank you. Shoot that. Great. And I'm going navigating between my inner and outer tables. Shot. And before I get too far, can you go to the other view, please? Sure. And I'm going way too posterior there, so I'm going to correct that so that I'm heading more anterior. Shoot that. And we can fix that on the imaging. Shoot that. Great. Shot. Shot. Yep, great, good. And so you can see here that I'm in my iliac wing. I'm heading towards the posterior column. I've got my drill far enough in. I'll take the guide now, please. Thank you. I'll take that out and I'll place my guide on this view and right into my entry point. Shoot that. Now that my guide is in, I'm going to insert my ball tip. Shoot that. Aiming towards the acetabulum. You can see it's curving around the acetabulum there. Shot. Great. And you can see here I've bisected the femoral head and I'm going to tap this in a little bit more. Shoot that. I'm going to aim, yep, good. Shot. Great. And so now you can see I'm in, come just a little bit. I'm in that ischial tuberosity. Shoot that. Excellent. And on the other view, 
I should be around the acetabulum here and heading down the ischial tuberosity as well, making sure that I'm posterior to the uh, posterior to the femoral head and in the posterior column. You can see it's curving now down that column. Shot. And you can see how it's bending into that distal ischial tuberosity. And I can seat that all the way down. Shot. There it is. Shot. Boom. Okay, good. You can see here that my wire is going around the acetabulum on this view into the posterior, around the posterior column. The acetabulum is safe and I've got the screw or at the, at least the wire right now in the right orientation. Come over, over the top, please and over to that obturator outlet view. This is a challenging screw to put in, challenging wire to put in, but once you can navigate around the acetabulum on these two views, it's very powerful to be able to place the screw and capture the entirety of the posterior column. One of the things to note on the measuring guide, and I think this is a really important aspect of the screw that I'll point out once I look at where my wire is going and come towards the head. Great, and you can see that that wire is going right down that posterior column very nicely. Good, okay. So we're gonna measure this. I'm gonna show a feature of the, of the length issue that is really important to understand. So the wire is, this is 190 millimeters uh, down this posterior column. So as you look at this 200 millimeter screw, you'll notice the linkages in between. As the screw goes through the canal, it can actually increase in length, particularly when it locks. And so while you might measure 200 millimeters, the screw can actually obtain a longer length based on the numbers that you see here on the side. So as an example, a 200 millimeter screw has the ability to become 200, up to 215 millimeters. I think you need to keep that in mind as you think about sizing of your screw and how it enters the bone and the path that it's going to take. And so you can see a visual of this when you see this ruler. I've stopped this screw at the one centimeter mark. I'm holding the screw rigid on the proximal body and I'm without moving the ruler I'm, and without really moving the position of the screw proximally, I'm gonna pull on all the links and you'll see that it goes from the five, the one millimeter mark to the 2.5 millimeter mark. So this screw just lengthened 15 millimeters, which is consistent with the markings, sorry, the markings that are on the, the, the measuring guide. And so I think that's just important to take into account. So as I measure 190 millimeters with this screw, I know that it can get up to 205 millimeters. And I have enough room to accept a 205 millimeter screw. So it's 190 here, plus 15 gives me up to 205, potentially. The flexible reamers here are really important because this is a very convoluted corridor to go down. You can hear bone the whole way. It gets really tight there. Shoot that. It's getting past that screw, I believe. Shoot that. Great. And then it's going to rock around the acetabulum. Shoot that. Gets hard again. Shoot that. Great. I'm going to come on out. All right. There you go. And then I will take the exchange tube. And again, this is a very narrow corridor. It's a very tight corridor in the sense of how it goes down. And so sometimes you do have to turn the beveled guide to navigate your way down, shoot that. And now my bolt, it, my uh, guide wire is down. Can I see the uh, exchange wire, please? Yep, thank you. I'm gonna slide my exchange wire in. And then I'm going to remove the tube and the other wire simultaneously. So for this screw, again, I'm not using a washer here. I don't want the screw head to be proud. Uh, this part of the anatomy, uh, there's typically not a lot of soft tissue. And even in patients with soft tissue, they can still sometimes feel the screw head. And the old screw design, before this uh, iteration, I would countersink. Uh, but this screw design, because it's a flat head, uh, does not uh, have the same issues that the uh, previous design did. And this is a 9.5 millimeter screw going down the posterior column, which uh, oftentimes can accept a, a screw of this size. Shoot that. 
I think I'm getting into that good hard bone right above the acetabulum. Shoot that. And you can see me going around the acetabulum there. Shoot that. And navigating, look at that. Pretty amazing. As it navigates down that iliac wing. Shoot that. And you can see it curving into that ischial tuberosity. And you can see it coming down that gluteus medius pillar. And you can see the screw kind of going around the acetabulum, uh, through the posterior column, around the existing hardware. So you can see I was able to navigate around that anterior column screw. Uh, and that is an advantage of a flexible implant. Okay. That goes on. You can see the color change there. I need this, uh, the wrench, please. I, I counter and I can click. That screw is now locked in the acetabulum. I can take this off. I'll take the extraction guide, please. And I can remove this. And that's nice and flush uh, in the iliac wing. Uh, we'll take an AP pelvis now, please. So through this one side and through three small incisions, we've been able to place a transiliac, transsacral screw. We've been able to place a antegrade posterior column screw. And we've been able to place an antegrade anterior column screw across the parasymphyseal region. We also have been able to navigate around an existing implant where our posterior column screw was able to navigate around our anterior column screw, and they did not interfere with each other in terms of application or placement. And so what we see here is the power of Curvifix in terms of the ability to position screws anywhere in the pelvis along all the various corridors that are present, including navigating around uh, existing implants.